The sky war begins. Ukraine deploys AI-controlled fighter drones. The first light over the front burned cold and thin, a silver that turned metal into a promise. Where before, there had been only the low hum of logistics and the clipped cadence of artillery reports, a new sound took hold. The discreet whine of electric motors, the whispered chatter of encrypted networks, the soft ping of an automated formation adjusting itself. Above the tree line, a dozen silhouettes resolved into the hard geometry of fighter drones. Not slow, consumer quadcopters, but sleek, winged, AI-guided platforms built to fight, hunt, and think together. The sky had become contested in a new register where code and aerodynamics would test one another, and Ukraine's armed forces had declared the contest open. This is a story of that declaration. How Kiev moved from swarms and FPV bombers to AI-controlled combat drones, what that means for tactics and ethics, and how human courage and human fear still shape the machines. It is also a chronicle of technology moving from lab to launch pad at wartime speed, of companies, engineers, and field commanders folding autonomy into the heat of battle and of the broader consequences for a region that already knows how quickly airspace can become a crucible. What Ukrainian commanders fielded in the opening weeks of this campaign were not mere reconnaissance drones rearmed. They were purpose-built, AI-enabled fighter drones designed to perform air-to-air -air and air-to-ground roles, with degrees of autonomy previously reserved for theory and simulations. These platforms merged lessons from years of cheap, attritable drones, modular FPV bombers, and long endurance reconnaissance aircraft with emergent onboard autonomy. Perception stacks for situational awareness, cooperative engagement protocols for team tactics, and mission planners that could reallocate objectives when communications were degraded. Ukraine's drone ecosystem had already matured into an industrial muscle by 2024 and 2025. The country's private sector and defense industry shifted from hobbyist builds to mass production, producing millions of small UAVs, while developing medium and large platforms that could carry heavier payloads and longer ranges. That industrial base made an audacious leap, integrating compact AI modules trained on targeted datasets and optimized for the rugged conditions of contested airspace into larger winged strike platforms. Those modules performed perception, navigation, and tactical reasoning, enabling the drones to detect threats, assign maneuvers, and execute proportional strikes inside rules of engagement determined by human commanders. This capability changed the geometry of the battlefield. Instead of tens of discrete, operator-in-the-loop attacks, Ukraine could orchestrate coordinated formations that behaved like autonomous squadrons. Scouts darting forward to map radar shadows, wingmen adjusting trajectories to mask signatures, and strike elements timing approaches to exploit gaps in enemy air defenses. For an army that had already mastered distributed operations on the ground, Autonomous aerial squadrons became an extension of that doctrine. Speed, dispersal, and cheap attributability combined with machine coordination. The path from experimental autonomy to operational fighter drones was neither linear nor purely technical. It was a wartime sprint built on improvisation, entrepreneurial energy, and intense learning cycles. Ukrainian companies and military units iterated quickly, moving from modular autonomy chips that could be plugged into FPV drones to more sophisticated software stacks for winged aircraft. The approach emphasized small, efficient models trained on narrow but highly relevant datasets, camera feeds, thermal profiles, radar contacts, rather than giant, generalist AI systems, a pragmatic choice that accelerated deployment and mitigated data requirements. Companies such as those clustered around the Brave One Incubator and other defense tech collectives drove this acceleration, raising money, delivering prototypes, and running field trials in partnership with frontline units. The result was rapid maturation. By late 2024 and into 2025, Ukraine deployed a variety of unmanned systems, long-endurance recon craft, attritable strike drones, 
and tactical FPV units in huge numbers and with domestic supply chains that surprised many analysts. These same networks now supported a second wave, AI-controlled fighters that retained the affordability of drone warfare, but added an ability to coordinate and make tactical choices under constrained supervision. Field commanders described the change as qualitative, not merely quantitative. Where earlier drone operations required large teams of operators and spotters, the AI squadrons reduced cognitive load on human controllers. Commanders could assign objectives and let the formation execute, reserving human judgment for high-level decisions. That allowed frontline units to concentrate on tempo and logistics, trusting autonomous aircraft to manage local air battles with millisecond-fast reflexes. How they fight? Watching an autonomous fighter squadron operate is to watch choreography written in code and wind. A typical mission began with a human planner assigning a mission envelope and constraints. Geography, no-strike zones, identification rules, and mission priorities. Swarm leaders, designated drones with enhanced sensors and compute, took up those inputs and formed a dynamic plan. Sensing and perception were layered. Visual cameras and infrared seekers provided optical feeds, while onboard radio frequency sensors detected emissions. Onboard inertial systems and GPS provided navigation, and data links allowed limited human oversight and software updates. Critically, perception models ran on small, efficient neural nets trained to identify aircraft silhouettes, missile plumes, and ground emplacements under diverse lighting and weather conditions. When communications were jammed, teams fell back to pre-planned autonomous behaviors that emphasized survival, mutual support, and mission continuity. Tactically, formations used deception and dispersion. Some drones acted as radar lures, broadcasting false signatures to draw interceptors away, while others exploited the opening to approach from low altitude or from the radar blind spot. In air-to-air -air engagements, AI fighters used cooperative positioning maneuvers. One drone would attempt to force an adversary into an energy-depleting pursuit, while another looped for a firing solution. Guided munitions were employed selectively, often in pairs, one drone niching a target with lasers or targeting data, and another delivering the strike. Human commanders retained authority over lethal outcomes, setting constraints that the AI respected, but the drones executed the fine-grained tactics with speed humans cannot match. The result was economy of force. Fewer expensive manned sorties were needed, air defense pressure on manned aircraft was reduced, and the enemy faced a sky where threats could come from coordinated, resilient, and partially autonomous teams. This was not abstract theory. Ukraine's operational evolution had already shown the potency of unmanned approaches. Since 2022, FPV and loitering munitions proved devastatingly effective against armor and logistics, while larger reconnaissance UAVs enabled strikes on high-value targets by feeding targeting information to artillery and missile systems. In 2024 and 2025, formal trials and battlefield tests accelerated the shift toward autonomy. Companies declared successful engagements under contested electronic warfare, and the first documented uses of coordinated unmanned strikes emerged as tactical precedent. Field reports emphasized robustness in the face of jamming and deception. Long endurance, V-BAT-style drones penetrated contested airspace to find and identify high-value assets and attritable swarms acted as both scouts and strike elements to overwhelm localized defenses. Ukrainian planners learned to pair AI fighters with traditional ISR and fires. Automated squadrons would find and pin targets, while artillery and missile units executed destructive effects, a cross-domain fusion that blurred the lines between air and ground campaigns. These operations forced adversaries to respond. Russian forces accelerated research into electronic warfare, decoys, and anti-drone systems while reconfiguring rules for air defense engagement in the presence of autonomous threats. 
The battlefield thus entered an arms race between autonomous coordination and countermeasures, with each adaptation driving further innovation. Deploying AI-controlled fighter drones raised immediate ethical and legal questions. The idea of machines making lethal choices tests international norms established when humans always made the final pull on the trigger. Ukrainian decision-makers faced balancing acts. They sought to preserve human oversight for lethal actions, to maintain discrimination between combatants and non-combatants, and to ensure proportionality in strikes. Machine autonomy was constrained by mission rules, human authorization nodes when possible, and bounded engagement envelopes designed to reduce the risk of unlawful strikes. Yet operational realities sometimes demanded compromise. In high-intensity engagements where latency could mean the loss of units or the targeting of civilians by hostile actors, the autonomy of drones provided a survival advantage. Planners argued that an AI-controlled fighter adhering to strict, vetted rules of engagement could actually increase compliance with the laws of armed conflict compared with tired, stressed human pilots making last-second choices under duress. Critics remained unconvinced, arguing that delegating life and death decisions to algorithms risks eroding accountability and opening a path to misuse. Those debates would not be resolved in a single campaign. They would follow the technology into boards, parliaments, and international foray. Even as machines took on more of the fighting, the human cost and human courage remained central. Ground commanders used AI fighters to reduce exposure of soldiers and pilots. Families felt both pride at technological prowess and fear of the new ways war would claim lives. Engineers and programmers who contributed code told stories of sleepless nights and field tests in freezing rain, watching their algorithms determine evasive patterns against simulated interceptors. A flight test engineer remembered the first time an AI fighter returned home after surviving a jammed environment. We watched its telemetry like parents after a newborn's first cry. There was joy, then exhaustion, then the knowledge we had changed how the front would fight. Pilots who once flew manned intercepts found themselves in new roles, mission supervisors, safety officers, and ethical controllers. Some felt relief that dangerous missions could now be done without risking blood. Others lamented the thinning line between human courage and mechanized efficiency. On the ground, soldiers sent messages to AI squads, folk blessings and emblematic names, old rituals transposed into the language of networks and commands. What are the strategic consequences? The deployment of AI fighters had strategic implications that extended beyond tactical success. On the one hand, it shifted cost calculus. Cheap drones that can think together impose persistent pressure on adversaries, forcing expensive and complex countermeasures. On the other hand, partial autonomy lowers thresholds for action in ways that could destabilize crisis dynamics. Rapid automated responses to perceived threats could spiral if not carefully bounded. Adversaries adapted. More sophisticated jamming, decoys, and interceptor drones emerged as counters, driving a cycle of offensive and defensive innovation. Beyond the battlefield, the diplomatic conversation scrambled. Neighboring states, treaty bodies, and arms control advocates raised concerns about unchecked autonomy and the need for norms. The reality of autonomous fighter drones in a hot theater made abstract debates urgent and political. Yet for Ukraine, autonomy was framed as a matter of necessity and survival. The country's industry and its allies viewed AI control as force multipliers, that could preserve human lives by replacing some of the most dangerous missions with automated coordinated systems. That calculus resonated in a nation where every gain in survivability could be decisive. What comes next? The first deployments were a harbinger, not a conclusion. Expect continued refinement, improved perception in cluttered environments, more resilient communications, and ethical guardrails baked into software. Countermeasures will become routine, 
agile interceptors, directed energy defenses, and specialized EW packs aimed at AI stacks. The battlefield will grow more complex and more computational, a place where decision cycles measured in milliseconds will matter as much as logistics measured in tons. Internationally, the presence of AI fighters in active combat will accelerate calls for norms. Some states will push for constraints on autonomy, others will argue for regulated use, and many will seek to maintain a competitive edge. Lawmakers will have to decide whether to insist on human-in-the-loop requirements, to standardize verification of ethical AI, or to treat autonomous systems as new classes of weapons requiring unique oversight. Above all, the human element will persist. Engineers will write code with trembling hands. Commanders will make agonizing choices about risk and restraint. Families will watch the sky for different reasons. The sky war begins with circuits and algorithms, but it will be remembered in the stories people tell about courage, mistake, and unexpected ingenuity. If this story gripped you, subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our next deep dive into emerging military tech and frontline innovation. Leave a comment below. Do you trust autonomous fighters to act within ethical and legal limits, or do you think humans must always make the final lethal decision? Tell us which part of the feature surprised you the most, and share any questions you want us to investigate in future episodes. We read every comment and feature the best ones in our follow-up briefings.